Hey everyone, buckle up, because today we're going to be diving into some seriously ancient history, uh, talking about cosmology. Way before telescopes, right? Way before telescopes, way before spaceships, all that. We're going way back. And to guide us on this journey, we're going to be looking at the Flat Earth Bible by Robert J. Shadewald. Okay. Now, before anyone out there thinks that we've totally lost it, yeah. we're not actually here to debate the shape of the Earth. Right. What we really want to do is unpack how the Bible itself describes the universe. Yeah. And why that perspective, you know, why that was so important for so long. It's fascinating. So if you are ready to kind of go back in time with us and look at this world through, you know, ancient eyes, then let's get into it. Let's do it. So to understand this whole Flat Earth view, we're going to have to set the stage a little bit. Our source, the Flat Earth Bible, uh, starts off with this idea that honestly, both geocentrists and Flat Earthers could get behind. They both kind of believe the same thing on this point, And that is that the Earth itself is immovable. Yeah, it's fixed. It's fixed. Now, for those who aren't familiar with that term geocentrism, it's basically the belief that Earth is at the center of the universe. Everything revolves around us. Exactly. And the Bible does say that the Earth is fixed, it's unshakable, and they use some pretty strong language to get that point across. Right. Like, I'm, I'm thinking about some of those verses in Psalms where it talks about God setting the Earth on its foundations. Exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. Psalm 93.1, it says that the Lord reigns, he has established the world, it shall never be moved. And you see that same idea throughout the Bible. You see it in First Chronicles. You see it in, in Psalms again, First Chronicles 16.3, Psalm 96 point have is one. Yeah. Both of those verses say that he has fixed the earth firm. It cannot be moved. This idea that the earth is stationary, it wasn't just some abstract concept for them. It was central to how they understood God's power, how they understood the order of all of creation. It's like, in their mind, the earth is this solid, unshakable foundation. Yes. And that actually ties in really well with how the creation story is told in Genesis, right? Because the order in which things are created really seems to line up with this model of the earth being flat. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So think about it. How does Genesis describe the firmament or the sky, as we call this? It says it's created on the second day. Okay. And this firmament separates the waters above from the waters below. Okay, so there's water above it. Yeah, you've got water above, you've got water below. Now, if you're picturing this, it only really makes sense if you're imagining a flat earth that's enclosed by a dome-like structure. Right, like a snow globe. Exactly. That's kind of what I'm picturing. Yeah, you got it. And that brings us to this whole concept of the firmament as a solid thing, like it's a physical object. It's not just like empty space up there. Right, right. And the Bible uses some pretty specific language to describe it. Yeah, it does. It's very deliberate, the language they use. Yeah. They use the Hebrew word rakia, and rakia actually means beaten out. Interesting. Beaten out. So it gives you this picture of like a metal worker who is hammering a sheet of metal, you know, into that dome shape. Wow. And there's this really vivid line in Job, in Job 37.18, and it says, can you beat out raka, the vault of the skies? as he does, hard as a mirror of cast metal. It's like this solid metal sky, like something straight out of ancient mythology. Right. This dome-shaped sky covering the earth. And speaking of which, our source material, it points to Ezekiel's vision as another piece of this puzzle. What's that all about? Yeah, Ezekiel's vision in Ezekiel 1.22-26, it really brings this whole image to life. He's talking about this vast shimmering surface, and he compares it to sheet of ice. A sheet of ice. A sheet of ice. And it's above the living creatures, which again, just further emphasizes this idea of a solid sky. Mm -hmm. But what's even more interesting, it says that God's throne is on top of this dome-like structure. So we've got this dome overhead, but what about the earth itself? Does the Bible ever actually come out and say... Like, hey, the earth is flat. Well, there are definitely some passages that people interpret as evidence for a flat earth. Like take Daniel 4.11, for example. Mm -hmm. It describes this tree, but it's not just any tree. It says this tree is so tall that it's visible to the earth's farthest bounds. Wow. Now, on a flat earth, that makes perfect sense, right? Yeah, I guess so. If something is tall enough, theoretically, you could see it from anywhere. But if you try to picture that on a spherical earth, yeah, no way. Not possible. It's amazing how ingrained our modern perspective is. Mm -hmm. We just, we don't even think about it, do we? Right. We just assume. Yeah. Okay. So if the earth is flat and it's covered by this dome, what about the sun and the moon and all the stars? Where do they fit in? How does the Bible describe those? Well, that's where things get really interesting mm -hmm. because the Bible's view of, well, the cosmos, it's so different from what we understand today, mm -hmm. you know, with science. 
Instead of thinking about these massive distances, these huge celestial bodies, the Bible, it actually portrays the sun and the moon and the stars as relatively small. Mm -hmm. And get this, anthropomorphic. Anthropomorphic. What does that even mean? It means they're given human-like qualities, like they have personalities. Oh, wow. Like, okay, so what, like they talk or something? Uh, well, not exactly talking, but for example, Psalm 19.46, it describes the sun's journey across the sky, but it says it's like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run his race. So it's beautiful. It's poetic. Right. But it also suggests that the cosmos is a lot more intimate, a lot more contained than how we understand it. So instead of being millions of miles away, it's almost like the sun is a character in this story that's unfolding. Exactly. And that makes a lot more sense for people living back then. Yeah. The much more relatable scale for them. And it totally fits in with this idea of a smaller enclosed universe with that firmament, that dome as its ceiling. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. What about the stars? Does the Bible say anything about, like, how big they are or what they're like, you know, to support this view? It does. And it often uses language that, well, makes it seem like they're a lot smaller and closer than what we now know, right? Yeah. For example, in Revelation 6.3, it talks about the stars falling from the sky. Oh, right, right. Which, that image makes a lot more sense if you're picturing a smaller universe, right? Yeah. It's not like these giant balls of burning gas that are millions of miles away are suddenly going to come crashing down. It's wild to me how these descriptions, these ancient descriptions that sound so strange to us now, can really make you stop and rethink your whole perspective. You know, this flat earth cosmology, it's got the dome-shaped sky, these celestial bodies that almost feel tangible. Was that a uniquely Hebrew thing, or did other cultures share these beliefs? That's a really important question, and it really highlights how crucial the historical context is here. Mm -hmm. Because, no, the Hebrews weren't the only ones who thought the earth was flat. Their neighbors, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, they had very similar cosmologies. Interesting. In fact, the Babylonians, they often depicted their universe as this dome-shaped structure, mm -hmm. almost like a vault, you know. And this vault, it had a flat earth enclosed within it. Sound familiar? Yeah, it's like exactly what we see in the Bible. Exactly. So we're really talking about a common worldview. Mm. In the ancient Near East, a flat earth was just kind of a given. Makes sense. But our source material, the Flat Earth Bible, it mentions another text that supports this view as well, something called One Enoch. Have you ever heard of that? Oh, One Enoch, yeah. Fascinating text. It's this ancient Jewish text written around the same time as parts of the Bible. It gets really detailed about a lot of these cosmological ideas that we've been talking about. So is it like part of the Bible? I've got to be honest, I've never even heard of this. It's complicated. So One Enoch, it's not in the Hebrew Bible as we know it today, but back then it was super widely read and it was really influential in those early centuries. Oh. In fact, it was so respected that the book of Jude, which is in the New Testament, it actually quotes one Enoch. Oh, wow. So this was something that like really Christians were familiar with. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's incredible. What kind of details does it give us about like what the cosmos is like? Well, one of the most interesting things about one Enoch is that it talks about these journeys to the literal edges of the earth. What? Yeah. So Enoch, who the book is named after, he's guided to these places where the sky literally meets the earth's surface. Like where the, that dome we've been talking about actually touches down. Wait, so they're like hitting a wall where the sky is? That's how it's described. Yeah. And at these edges of the world, get this, there are these open gates of heaven. And it actually kind of lines up with some stuff we see in the Bible too, like in Jeremiah 51.16, it mentions rain and wind coming from the ends of the earth. Oh. So you've got the solid dome up above, but then at the edge of the world, it just kind of touches down. That is wild. Yeah. And it really paints a very, very different picture of the universe than we're used to. Yeah, no kidding. And one Enoch doesn't just stop there, does it? Oh, no, it goes into a lot of detail. Like, it even talks about how the sun and the moon have these storerooms at the ends of the earth. Yeah. And that's where they go when they're not shining. Okay, now that is some next level cosmology. It's like, you know, we have maps today and we think, oh yeah, we've got it all figured out. But back then, their concept of the universe was like their map and it was just as real to them. Yeah, and it really just drives home the point that how we understand, well, anything, but especially something as big as the cosmos, it changes over time. You know, those ancient descriptions, they weren't just made up stories. They were based on 
the best knowledge that they had at the time. Right. It was their science. And it just shows how interconnected all those cultures were back then. Like hmm. the Hebrews, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, they were all drawing on similar ideas about the universe. It wasn't just one group off in a corner somewhere. It was like a shared worldview. Exactly. It was a shared worldview. And that worldview, it emphasized this idea of a really structured, really purposeful cosmos. <laughs> and that idea, it had a huge impact on how they understood everything. I mean, we were talking religion, philosophy, art, literature, you name it. It's like they were looking at the world through a totally different lens, you know, than we do. So to kind of bring it all back to our source material here, the Flat Earth Bible, it really makes it clear how much these ancient ideas about cosmology, how much they really influenced how the Bible was written. A hundred percent. Yeah. And by understanding that context, we can really appreciate, I don't know, just the richness, you know, the richness of the beliefs, the ideas, all of that, that shaped those ancient texts that we still read today. Well, it's definitely been a trip exploring this ancient view of the cosmos with you. It's been fun. It's amazing to me how something that seems so simple now, like the shape of the earth, was once something that people really thought hard about. You know, it was a big deal. It really makes you wonder, what are people going to think about our understanding of the universe, you know, thousands of years from now? What will they look back on and be like, wow, they really believe that? That's a great question to leave everyone with. Until next time.